you would like to open your Bibles to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now, I mentioned at the beginning seeing the uh, black bear on the side of the road. I did not stop to ask if it was a black bear. That's my assumption. Um, but we did lock eyes the whole time as I was passing by. It was kind of funny. He was looking at me like, what's that guy doing? And I was looking like, why is there a bear over there? Um, the funny thing is, not only was that not part of my plan for my drive, I took a wrong turn to get on that road in the first place. And uh, I w- my intent was, when I got to Tallahena to take the scenic drive, uh, because although I was in a hurry, it only adds like a half hour to the trip, so I thought, oh, I'll, d- I'll just do that, and I missed the turn. Uh, and so I ended up on the, the main highway, that, if you can call it a main highway down that way, and there I am, and the bear's there on the side of the road, and it, it was all kind of this mess that happened when the plan went awry. So I want to ask you this morning as we start, what are your plans? I think we all have plans of some kind. Uh, Butch mentioned in class making a list every morning of the things that he does. Uh, I don't make lists, which is probably why my plans don't get done as much as they should. But uh, some of you are list makers, and that's kind of the thing you do. Some of you have the, uh, the habits you get into. Uh, I started something last year partly as part of a class I was taking, uh, but it's kind of caught on in my life, and I've kept going into it with this year, which is called the rule of life. And it's kind of these things that you're trying to do, some of them being in life, some of them you're trying to complete within a year's time, Uh, some of them are things you want to do daily, and there are all kinds of different things that may fit into that. Uh, I wanted to be more intentional about uh, the way I was reading my Bible and what I was trying to accomplish in doing that. Uh, I wanted to be more intentional about uh, the exercise bike in the corner of the office being something that actually was ridden on instead of having clothes hung on it. Uh, And so there are different things that I was trying to do that I planned for. And a lot of times when those plans go off course, we react differently. Uh, There are some of us that just adapt as situations come, and that's a really good talent to have. Uh, Your employer will probably appreciate that a lot as things change in your work that you're able to adapt and do things differently. For some of us, when the plans go awry, it just messes up our whole day. Uh, And we find ourselves, we keep going back to, but I had this planned, and now that I'm not doing that, everything is just a mess, and I can't be happy with whatever happens not realizing that sometimes something better comes along. Uh, If I had gone on the scenic drive, I'm sure it was scenic, uh, and I've done that once before with my wife. Uh, Last year, we tried to go to see the leaves changing, and we missed it by a week. Uh, And so we saw a scenic drive of sticks uh, as we went along. It was just lots of brown and no leaves at all. Uh, And so this time, if I went, it would have all been green, I guess, but I wouldn't have seen a bear, or or maybe I would. Who knows? But uh, sometimes when the plans don't go according to plan, that's when things actually good happen. Uh, So as we start here in James chapter 4, we'll begin in verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. The sin here, uh, according to the IVB Bible background commentary, the sin here is presumption, arrogant presumption, feeling secure enough to leave God out of one's calculations. I don't think we would admit to doing this as Christians, but oftentimes we don't think of God first or sometimes at all as we're making a plan. We have all these plans for the other things that are supposed to happen, and God is not really there in the midst of it. And because of that, God is not really honored in our plans at times, and sometimes that may be the reason why the plans go awry. Now, the plans that James describes here in 4.13 involve different things. They involve timing. Uh, And a lot of our plans revolve around the idea of the timing being just exactly as we want it. Uh, They involve a destination. There's this place we're going to go, uh, and there's something we're going to do when we get there. They involve a duration of stay, that you're going to go to this place, you're going to be there for this long. Uh, You know, when I came to Ada uh, three and a half years ago, my intent was to always be in Ada. Uh, And I have no idea how that will go, and I hope that God is part of that plan too, but I would love to retire here. But I also don't know, does something happen a year from now, or five years from now, or 10 or 20 years from now? that changes that plan? And am I willing to, uh, and you, are you willing to allow God to work within that? Uh, and then fourth, it involves activities, the things that you will do when you're there, the, the things that will happen, what you will see, what you will do, how things will go for them, the idea of making a profit that's going to happen while they're there. And oftentimes, these plans that we make d- don't only not begin with God, they just don't seem to include God at all. Uh, now, the other thing I didn't tell you about my drive this weekend was Uh, I was going over to Hot Springs uh, just for an overnight. I have friends there from college that for 28 years have had a fantasy football league together. And I got in it about six years ago now, and they get together every August, and they have their draft. They're actually still there this morning. Uh, I preach and don't want to waste a Sunday on that, so I I come back for it. But we get together, and it's all these guys you went to college with, and it's kind of interesting to catch up and all of that stuff. 
But on my way over there, shortly after seeing the bear, uh, I made a stop in Mina, and, and I got back into the truck, and at that point, for some reason, my phone and data did not get along. And so I had no GPS. Uh, I'm suddenly back to the, the Stone Ages. I realized my atlas, I actually do own an atlas, by the way, uh, is in my wife's trunk, which does me no good because I'm in my truck at the time. And so I, I don't know where I'm going. I, I know I'm going to Hot Springs. I have no idea really how to get there because I'm so dependent on the GPS. And so I have enough GPS left that I can see part of the map, but not all the way to Hot Springs and no longer my magical blue line that's leading me there. And so I look and I realize Highway 8 out of Mina goes east, Hot Springs is east, so there we go. And I will just go and hope to see some signs along the way. And so I just start driving east on Highway 8. I found out later I did not take the best route to get to Hot Springs. Uh, at one point I called my wife I said, if there's any way you can look on a map or GPS or anything and tell me where I should turn to get to Hot Springs, and right around that time I lost my signal again. And so... I kept kind of drive, uh, driving blindly along, and I, I realized very quickly the irony of all of this, that I'm coming back Sunday to talk about your plans and when they don't go the way you think they're going to go and all of that. And God has kind of given me this object lesson in all of it, that sometimes you just have to adapt to whatever's coming along. And most of all, we need to have God as a part of our plans to begin with. So there's a problem with these kind of plans. And, and James is going to tell us what those problems are. Starting in verse 14, he says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So he says, you do not know what's going to happen. You don't know what's around the next corner. Uh, as I'm going along on Highway 8 there in Arkansas, I don't remember what it was in Oklahoma, but it was 8 when I got to Arkansas. I, I was going around this curve, and I started to notice people flashing their lights at me. And I thought, okay, they're speed trap ahead. They're trying to warn me. They're, they're doing that thing that drivers do. And then at some point, I noticed there's now a police officer behind me. And people kept flashing their lights. And I, I thought, you really shouldn't flash your lights at me when there's actually a policeman behind me. That's probably not a good idea for you. And I thought, what is wrong with these people? And every car that would come by would flash their lights. And then I rounded a curve, and I saw the blue lights. And I saw more blue lights. And I saw someone in a rider rental truck that had gone off the road. Uh, and down into a ditch, and there was stuff. He had obviously been moving things. There was stuff that was kind of strewn along the ground there. And I thought, you know, this is not what he set out for this morning. If you've ever driven a, a U-Haul or a rider truck along, you're just hoping they've checked the tires and done all the things they should do, hoping you get from point A to point B, and you just want to get where you're going. And all, in all of his planning, it was, man, it's going to be a hassle to unpack on the other side. I, I hope the people who are going to help me show up for that. Uh, I, I hope, you know, I plan the gas stations well in between because this thing gets such horrible mileage. He probably never thought in all of that, I'm going to end up off the side of a curvy road in Arkansas uh, with fire trucks coming and with police officers coming and an ambulance coming, and this will change everything about my day and what's going on, if not my life, depending on how that accident goes. We don't always know what's going to happen. And then secondly, you're a mist. And, and what do we know about a mist? It's you're driving along, and you go kind of down into a, a lower part of that drive, and there's a, a mist that's there because of the lay of the land. But if you come to that same spot later in the day and the sun has come out, it's nothing. It's just a clear riding day along. You are temporary. I am temporary. And so all these plans that we make, these plans that James talks about, they may or may not happen not just because situations change, but because we may not even be there for the time that they would happen anyway. And it's probably not the happiest thought to think of this morning, but we, we all know stories like that, don't we? Where life has changed so much that all of the things people had in mind, just they're not able to come around. And that someday you thought would happen, that get around to it you thought would be there, it, it never does. And you never do get around to it, and that someday doesn't come. The psalmist puts it this way in the verse that we read uh, as we started. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. There is a wisdom that comes with perspective. When we begin to understand that these plans that we make, they're fine, they're good, hopefully that they are centered on God, and because of that, they're even better plans, but they may or may not happen in the way we want them to happen, in the time we want them to happen, doing the things we want to happen, and honestly, they may or may not happen at all. And if we have the perspective to understand that God knows the number of our days, God knows our plans much better than we do, then we can see where we fit into it all with him. Then James shows us there's a solution. So he's, he showed us the problem. 
Uh, and I love that he comes with a solution because there are far too many people in our world already that are very quick to point out the problem. Here's the thing that's wrong. Uh, by the way, I believe the reason why there was a bear on the left side of the road is because on the right side of the road there was a set of dumpsters that were there for people who were driving along or camping or whatever. And my guess is that the lids or whatever are supposed to be on those dumpsters, some of them were not, or there were things strewn around those dumpsters. And the bear thought, like, once that truck gets out of the way, it's lunchtime, and I'm going over there. So there's not just the problem. There's not just looking at something and saying, man, you should do this differently. This is not going well. James offers a solution. So he says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So he says, if the Lord wills. Now, for most of us, where have we heard this? This has been the tagline on a prayer for most, has it not? You've heard this. This fits right with the guide garden direct. You've heard your entire life or the build a hedge around it and all those, those prayer uh, cliches that we have. It's almost just become another thing that we throw into the prayer because we're supposed to say it. Uh, or maybe it's a, it's a throwaway at the end of we're, we're closing our time together and we say we'll be back together at 5 o'clock, we'll be back together on Wednesday, God willing, or if the Lord wills. And sometimes we mean that. And sometimes it's just the thing we say. It's just one of those things that has become part of language. Uh, Deo Valente, which is something I, most of us have probably never heard of, but Deo Valente is the Lord wills or God willing in Latin. And this is something that was a regular part of things probably 100 years ago. Uh, in, in the book James Faith That Works, Kent Hughes says, Deo Valente is to be the constant refrain of our hearts as we conduct the affairs of our lives. If God wills, must be written on our students' plans, uh, the choice of a life partner, future education, all everyday activities. Older people need to say from the heart, if God wills, I will spend my time. If God wills, my children will become. If God wills, I will take up this ministry. If God wills, I will wake up tomorrow. All of us should have this heart attitude. DV, before and after everything, presupposes a life of dependent prayer in which all is taken before God. It means further a profound submission, for God willing, truly said, from the heart, cannot produce anything else. So if we are saying God willing from the heart, that's what's going to result, God's will in action. Uh, and I learned, looking at this, that 100 years ago, if you saw an ad for something, uh, if there was the, the cruising on Main thing that happened not too long ago, or if there's the, the county fair that comes along, or whatever event, howdy days that come up, uh, there was, at the bottom of that ad, DV, oftentimes. Even here in America, about 100 years ago, you would have DV, which was the idea that, God willing, this thing will happen. God willing, and, and the creeks don't rise, God, God willing, and he doesn't come back before then, these things are going to happen. Now, for most of us, we don't really consider the option that God could come back before I am done with this sermon. Now, you may be praying for it already, but don't. We, we, we don't think that. We, we, we think, you know, sure, he's going to come back, but that's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. That's not going to happen in my kid's lifetime or their kid's li Somewhere down the road, Jesus is going to come back, and that's going to happen. But we've been waiting thousands of years at this point, and it's, it's but what if it's tomorrow? What if it's before the 5 o'clock service tonight? What if, what if it's before we're done here? How much do the plans we have made mattered if God is not involved in them? So God willing should not just be the tagline on something. It should be something much larger than that. Uh, this is a, a quote from me. God willing is not just a disclaimer. It's a way to approach life. Uh, it acknowledges our dependence on him. When we say God willing, it, it's not just, well, we're going to say this just to we want to make sure God is okay with what we're praying about, or we want to make sure people understand that God is relevant to us, but it is truly a, we want God's will to be done here. And sure, we're going to ask boldly for what we want. Sure, we're going to plan for things, but we want God to be in the midst of all that. We want God to saturate all of that. So in, verse four, uh, in chapter 4, verse 16, he says, As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So he warns us about boasting. Now, I want you to, to not go the direction most of us go with boasting when we hear about boasting, which is automatically somebody else. No one thinks of themselves as a boastful person. No one thinks, thinks of themselves as bragging or anything like that. Uh, believe me, I just spent yesterday sitting in a room of uh, 11 guys who are all competing in their knowledge of football, and none of us really know what we're doing. And, and we're picking players, and every, people have researched. And uh, there were multiple times, by the way, that one of the guys in the room, uh, he waited the full three minutes you're allowed to wait, and, and sometimes beyond that, trying to figure out the player for his pick in the 10th round of a meaningless draft. Not meaningless, but anyway. 
Uh, as, and he got to the end of that time where we're all like, come on, just make a pick. And he makes a pick, and it's someone that was chosen four rounds ago. And then we have to start it all over again, and we all give him a hard time. Boastful works its way in all kinds of things. It's not just this big, giant stuff. We get boastful about all kinds of things in life. But I want to give you uh, a few examples. Boastful, boastful has a higher, uh, a broader definition than we think. It's, it's not just all the big stuff, but I, want, I do want to give you a few big stuff examples in Scripture. Uh, in 1 John 2.16, John says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. Uh, we see this tied with the temptations of Jesus a lot of times, but at its core, most of the things that we will boast about, most of the things we will allow pride to take over in our lives, most of the things we will get selfish about fall into these categories. Th these are the things of life that we allow us to, to have us take the focus off of God. These are where we make the plans where God is not always involved. And so we're warned about it, uh, I think, in these examples. First of all, Herod Agrippa. Uh, it's a story we're familiar with in Acts 12. Uh, in Acts 12, in verse 21, we read, On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat on the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God, not a man. And Herod was just taking it all in. There are all kinds of compliments I've gotten uh, or occasionally unjust criticisms I've gotten after sermons. I've never got the voice of a God, not a man. Uh, and I don't want to start today, by the way. But, but I wonder if someone were to give us that kind of compliment that just goes off the scale, how we react to it. Now, a lot of us are kind of self-deprecating and we, we don't like that thing. Uh, some of us take the compliment but kind of unsure about it. Uh, Agrippa, man, he's just taking it all in. And we know what God does. It says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. He was eaten by worms and breathed his last. So with Agrippa, what we see is that boasting leads to death. Now, for Agrippa, in a very much on earth, in that moment kind of sense. But for us, boasting does not lead us to the spiritual place with God we want to be. When we are boasting of ourselves, it leads us instead away from him. When God willing is not part of how we live, it leads us away from him instead of towards him. Then a second exa example, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there are a lot of stories of Nebuchadnezzar we, we look at and we're really familiar with. This one may be a little less familiar. It says in Daniel 4 and verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, is, this not, uh, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? What is it about Babylon, by the way? you got all these people back all the way in Genesis building a tower, and when they're building the tower, it says the reasoning is so people will look at us and see how great we are. Not, not so people will point to God or see God, but people will see how great we are. And now you have the king of Babylon coming along, and he is just looking at all this saying, look at what I have done. And, and again, we don't have kingdoms that I'm aware of, but do we sometimes have things that are ours, something we have worked hard for, something we have done, that we just want to say, look at what I have done. And see how great this is. And we leave God out of the equation. And what we have, and we'll kind of skim through this real quick and then skip ahead in slides. But what we have is Nebuchadnezzar then being warned, this is not going to lead somewhere you want to go. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. This is going to be awful. And then Nebuchadnezzar eventually, later in this chapter, repents of it all. Realizes the error of his ways. And he comes back. And comes back and realizes, I... This is not all just me. There, there is a God who is at work here, and there's something greater at work, which is to say, reason leads to repentance. When we can look at the situation, look at the plans, look at where God is, look at who we are, and realize that God is great in all of this, and we are his servants in all of this, then we have that kind of reason we can move past the boasting and instead repent of that and move towards who God wants us to be. And then a third example in the life of Paul. It says when the crowds, in Acts 14, when the crowds saw that Paul was done, they lifted up their voices saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowd. So everybody wants to come and they want to worship Paul and Barnabas. Look at these amazing things that they're doing. They're, they're healing, they're doing miraculous things, and because of that, we want to come in and we want to worship them. But when Paul, 
uh, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and they rushed out to the crowd. So they have the opposite from the very beginning. Uh, it's not like Agrippa where they just take it all in and yes, look at all the great things we've done, come and worship. It's not like Nebuchadnezzar where they begin that way by seeing how great they are and then eventually coming around to who God is. Here, right from the start, they know that none of this is okay. He says, men, why are you doing these things? We're also men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So humility instead points others toward God. You begin with Agrippa who's, who's loving everyone, pointing towards him, and eats that up. And then you see the example of Nebuchadnezzar who's able to repent and turn that around. But with Paul, it's humility from day one. What if we make our plans instead of in the boastfulness of ourselves and the confidence of ourselves in the humility of knowing our place with God? If the humility of understanding that he truly is in control, that God willing is a way of life, not just something that we tag on to the end of the prayer. Or the way Paul words it in 1 Corinthians first, uh, chapter 1 and verse 30. Because of him you were in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So instead, boast in the Lord. If you want to boast in something, if you want to have pride somewhere, if you want to realize there is someone who has power over everything that sometimes we feel like we have power over, boast instead in God. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is one of those verses we pull out of context, isn't it? Uh, I, I know uh, Wes McAdams, who's down in the Dallas area, some of you guys know him, he's preaching a series right now that's one of those that I wish I would have had the idea, uh, and now I have to figure out how long I can wait before I can copy it. Uh, but I love the idea, it's, it's verses taken out of context. He calls it twisting scripture. Uh, he did Jeremiah 29 last week, the, uh, for the, no, I, the plans I have for you, which God does have plans for us and God does have hope for us, but it's not from Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 is about something totally different. This, I believe, would fit really well into that. I don't know if he's going to do this one or not. We pull this out and we talk about sins of omission quite a bit, which I, I believe we could probably apply it to that if we want to stretch a little. But think of what James has just finished talking about. The thing we know we should do, when we know that God should be included our, in our plans and at the forefront of our plans, and we don't do that, it's not just not making good plans. It, it's not just making a list that was not the right list. It's sin. James is not talking about murder or gossip or envy or disobeying your parents, although all those things fit into other sin lists we find in scriptures. James is talking here about when your plans do not involve God, when your plans say in your life and to the world around you, I've got it all figured out and I can do this on my own, it is sin. Something's pretty serious. And we who, Christians who are always looking for the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, here's one. When, when we have this thing we know we should do and we don't do it, it is sin. So I'll ask you the question, what is the right thing to do here? Every plan we make should involve God. Every plan we make should begin with God. What should I do about my retirement plan? Is God involved in that? Should I move into this new job? Have I factored God into that? What should I do when there's a conflict in church? Should I go somewhere else? Should I stay and work it out? Where's God in that? What should I do when I approach, approach my brother or sister with, with a problem that I see in their life? Is God involved in that? What should I do when I'm a person who always sees the problems but never offers the solution? Am, am I involving God in that? Am I looking into my own life as critically as I look into the lives of others? Is God involved in all of that? What is the right thing to do? And then the question we began with, what are your plans? And I don't know what your plans are this morning. I, I hope if God was not at the very beginning of the list before, that when you make your first list of the rest of your life tomorrow, that he's the first thing on it then. That you will find ways to center those plans on God. If God does not permeate all of the lists that you have, I hope that you will begin to plan for that. I hope you will begin to plan God in the midst of your plans. And I believe you will find a number of things with that. I, I will believe you will find a, a satisfaction within your plans. I will believe you will recognize that when the plans don't go the way you thought they should, that your first inclination is, is not, why is it always wrong with me? Why is it always bad with me? But what, what is God doing here? And, and how can I get on board? This morning, I believe God does have a plan for you. And I believe part of that plan for you is that you're sitting here now today or watching online if you're watching that way 
to, to be a part of this body, to learn more about him. And if you don't have a relationship with him, to begin that today. There is no better plan you can make today than to be baptized into his son, to be baptized into the church, to change your life in that way. Or if you have walked away and if you've made your own plans, to come back to him today, to confess sin that you may have, to ask for the prayers of the church. If there's some way we can help with you this morning with all of those things, please come as we stand and sing.